These peaks are part of a mountain range that stretches from Maine to Georgia, Appalachia, a word that labels more than just a topographical region. For generations, this word has been a label for a way of life, and that label has not always been a positive one. In the early 1960s, many Americans had their first look at a region called Appalachia. In films and magazine articles directed toward America's war on poverty, viewers saw images of filthy mountain simpletons living in poor conditions, ignorant, sometimes hostile, and invariably substandard human beings. More than 40 years later, these are the stereotypes that residents of Appalachia continue to battle, sorting through the misconceptions, recounting their lives and traditions and heritage, telling the real story of the families and communities that have grown up in these mountains, and trying to affirm the wealth of culture that lies almost hidden in the mountain's shadow. This is a, really a long, uh, a, a long story. It goes back before, uh, even before Appalachia. I think James Fenimore Cooper and, and you know, the idea of the mountain person, the natural man, and so forth. Sometimes these were looked on positively. Sometimes with fear and uh, and loathing. And I think anytime people are different, you have a certain fear of them. And uh, and so you uh, you sometimes distance yourself from them, and they, they become those people. But Appalachia, a lot of stuff was written, and there was a lot of violence in Appalachia. The feuds after the Civil War uh, created a, uh, an image: the Hatfield McCoy feud, the Baker White feud. They fascinated writers who came and wrote these little uh, ten cent uh, novellas, you know, about these. Uh, violent and fierce people down here. And it was almost as if we've got to get rid of these hillbillies and their strange and violent ways before we can develop this land and become civilized people, you know. People tend to stereotype from a few instances. They see one person who's drunk or one, two people in a fight somewhere in Appalachia and they extrapolate from that that all of these people are violent or drunkards. You can come into Appalachia, you can go into a city and find the same type of people, the same type of stories, but because it's not back in the mountains, uh, because it's not involving country people, uh, you don't notice it as much. But I think the early uh, people that came in, the early chroniclers uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, for some reason zeroed in on those things that they felt were really quaint, uh, even backward, if you will. Uh, and I don't think that they were backward. I think what it was is that the society had not changed here. Uh, they were still uh, revolving around the seasons, uh, around making do, knowing how to make do with very little. It was these people who were making do with very little that President John F. Kennedy came across in campaigning for office in the Appalachian region. As a result, his concerns about the region generated several outreach programs in states like Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky. And with the passage of several bills in the mid-1960s, America's war on poverty became official. In Appalachia, new roads were constructed to provide better access for residents and new industries. Water systems and new schools were built. And as America waged war on poverty, Appalachia found itself under siege. Cecil Bradfield, a native of the mountain hamlet of Arkansas, West Virginia, left his home to attend college in Ohio, but recalls that period of outreach that lays like a double-edged sword in Appalachia's history. I returned to, uh, to West Virginia as a rural pastor in 1965, just as the war on poverty was uh, getting in full swing and actually uh, some of the time I worked with Vista volunteers who were coming in in large numbers in, in the area where I was working in West Virginia near Franklin. If we look back on the war on poverty, it was based on a model, a deficiency model of, uh, of people. That the reason that you uh, are experiencing poverty and deprivation is because you're deficient in other ways. You're deficient in education. You're deficient in awareness of the rest of the world and, and some of those things. So I think in some respects that that uh, had a negative impact on the self-esteem 
of people who were living in Appalachia. I would receive calls from uh, some of my colleagues, say in suburban DC, and these are, these are church colleagues, pastors, and uh, they would say uh, something like, we'd like to bring some of our young people up to see poor people. They were seeing the national publicity, the documentaries on Appalachia, and isn't it terrible that these people, 125, 140, 50 miles from us, are living in these conditions? And so there was something about that that didn't really strike me right. You know, here I am, I'm an Appalachian, I'm working in Appalachia, and here are people from uh, uh, an area considered to be very wealthy, and they're saying, could we bring some of our kids to see poor people? And what they didn't say is, you poor people. These negative stereotypes did not reflect the Appalachia that Cecil grew up in and remembers fondly. And like many of the Appalachians we met in producing this program, he was eager to set the record straight about what life in Appalachia was and is really like. Arkansas is a, a hollow. It has one road in, one road out, and uh, at the center of the community uh, there is a church and a uh, school, a one-room school that I attended for three years. Growing up there, we, we never thought of ourselves as being deprived in any way and, and really focused on some of the positive aspects of of um, a family and being in a, a community, but there was not a sense of, of deprivation or poverty. Uh, we had enough. I grew up in North Carolina in the, the mountains in the western part of the state, and uh, of course at that time I was born in 1928, and so I uh, was a, an infant when the Great Depression came, and we lived on a farm. We were subsistence farmers, and I don't think we noticed the depression as much as a lot of people because we grew food and uh, had our own you know, milk cows and chickens and eggs and that sort of thing. And so, but it was a rather uh, sparse existence in a way. And as a lot of people have said, you know, that uh, we were poor, but we didn't know it at the time. Phyllis Street had a similar upbringing. She was raised in a small community in the mountains of Southwest Virginia. So many places were remote. In fact, where I grew up, because of the Depression and the, then the start of World War II, uh, in the little community where I was raised, we didn't have electricity until 1949. Times were really hard here on the mountain. There was no public works. Um, uh, the most um, of the way that people made a living was um, uh, through gardening, farming, uh, and they, they were self-sufficient just like we were when we were at home. We raised practically everything we ate. When I was growing up, there was a lot of small farms in the area, tobacco farms. Uh, coal mining was the big, the big industry even when I uh, graduated from high school in the late 70s. Um, Coal was king. Guys that I went to high school with, after they finished high school, they'd get a job driving a coal truck or whatever, and make more than someone who went on to, co you know, her just graduate from college. Coal mining was difficult and dangerous work. Making a living in these mountain communities was not an easy task. Life in Appalachia has created a culture of hardworking, self-sufficient, and inventive people. For generations, virtually everything had to be grown or handmade. Foods, clothing, tools, even medicines and cures had to be created in the imagination when the nearest hospital or doctor was miles and miles away. My, uh, my wife and I uh, both make a point of telling the grandson stories about growing up in West Virginia and uh, some of the remedies for certain conditions. Now they, they both have, our grandsons have ear infections and so they go to the pediatrician, they get a box of psyllin or, or something uh, uh, for those ear infections and it uh, kind of cracks them up a little bit when we tell them that uh, both, uh, uh, for me, my mother had a uh, corn cob pipe and when we had ear aches, we didn't call it an ear infection, we had ear aches, uh, she would uh, blow smoke in our ears, and, and you will talk to a lot of people my age and older who had that same remedy. And uh, we got over the ear infection or the earache or whatever uh, 
whatever it was. Uh, some of the herb cures that have come down to us uh, seem really funny now, like smoking green mullen leaves if you have an irritated throat. Why would you smoke something if you have an irritation in your throat? Uh, but modern science has shown that there's something in the mullen leaves that actually does soothe an irritated throat if you smoke it. The early self-sufficiency of the mountain people has led to a unique Appalachian heritage. Items that were once made out of necessity have now become art forms. One of the best things that um, I can remember growing up was mother would, she sewed our clothes a lot. She made a lot of our clothes and any scraps that she had left over she would work into a quilt. And it, it wasn't necessarily a piece of art, it was just a functional quilt. But I remember, you know, like laying on the bed or in the bed at night and going through those, you know, the squares on her quilt and thinking, oh, this was this and this was that and this was something else because it was just bits and pieces of cloth that, you know, she had saved back from our, you know, clothes and, and that type of thing. The older I get, the more I appreciate that someday I won't have my mother. I can touch these things that she made and maybe that, you know, that'll keep me closer to her. That's, that's made me realize a lot of things. Jeannie says that one of the things she realized was the importance of preserving her heritage. After graduating from East Tennessee State University, she returned home to Southwest Virginia and began working for PACE, Purely Appalachian Crafts Empowerment. She now spends her days educating people about Appalachian heritage and marketing the beautiful artwork that comes out of the region, and not just in Virginia. She recently accompanied Appalachian craftsmen and their work to London for an exhibition. It was during this project that she met Phyllis Street, a coal miner's widow who had learned quilting from her mother at a very young age. One thing that I really, really enjoyed whenever I was smaller was when mother would get her um, bag of scraps out in the winter time to make quilts, and I would play with those. In fact, mama has said that I think you were born with a needle in your hand. <laughs> And uh, Mama made quilts for us to sleep under with what was available. Uh, of course, you know, at that time, uh, feed for the uh, cattle and hogs and so forth, chickens, usually came in printed sacks. And of course, those were used for everything, clothing and, and whatever and scraps of those was used for piece and quilts and I was, you know I just used whatever that mama was not using and I just picked up whatever <laughs> colors and put together but it was it was mine it was something I had created and to me it was special. Phyllis used to be a professional dressmaker and ran her own fabric shop but she says that quilting which had been a part of her family for generations was a part of her that just had to come out. She began making quilts for family members and eventually decided to make quilts for sale. Doing a quilt is <laughs> kind of compared to having a child. <laughs> that, uh, it's hard to turn loose of one. When I sell a piece, then I know if someone is willing to pay the price for my quilt, then it's gonna be taken care of mm -hmm. and they're going to appreciate it. Yeah. In fact, the first one I sold was I s traded it to my gynecologist. He did hysterectomy <laughs> for me, and, and I, I swapped the quilt for the... <laughs> Today, Phyllis's quilts sell for several thousand dollars a piece. She sells to people all over the country. But in addition to providing an income, the quilts provide a way for her to preserve and pass on her heritage. Every quilt has a title, and many tell a story of a period in her life. My mother loved fabrics and color and everything that when I was making that quilt, as each piece that I sewed down, I would think, oh, mother would have loved this. Mother would have loved this. And it was just more or less a communion with Mother mm -hmm. whenever I was making it. Yeah. And that's why that I named it Memories of Mother. Like any art form, Phyllis's quilts are an expression of herself, her personality, her history. She has passed on her skills to her four daughters, and although they all have other careers, the tradition of quilt making and its heritage will live on in her family. 
Gaynell Marshall hopes that the same can be said of her craft. She makes these intricate and unusual dolls from corn shucks, again a tradition that came out of that Appalachian self-sufficiency, where store-bought toys were a rarity, and most children played with items that were made with the materials on hand, in this case, the shucks from ears of corn. The way I got into the corn shuck dolls is my mother-in-law, whom I call Mother. Mother Marshall started making the corn shuck dolls in in or around 45. She needed uh, uh, not something to do because she had plenty to do. She had six children at that time, but um, uh, she needed a source of income. And when she did start making them, she got 25 cents a piece for them, where I now get 15, 20 dollars a piece for them. Gaynell's dolls depict everything from storybook characters to biblical figures to various aspects of Appalachian life. I, I haven't done one stirring apple butter, but I think that's one I'm going to to, uh, to work on. I think that would be a great one. Because like, I can remember myself uh, stirring apple butter all day long, or Mommy doing it. Uh, in the very early years, I, uh, Mommy would put her bonnet on and sit there and stir apple butter. Like many Appalachian artists, Gaynell has taken on the responsibility of preserving her heritage, but she says she realizes that if her special brand of art is to continue, she will have to educate people outside of her own family. Honey, I've always known that because I did have just the sons. Um, and then, too, I've always taught through the schools. Anytime that the, the schools have what they call Appalachian Heritage Days, they, they pull in the local crafters in a... I've done it more uh, in the earlier years than I have in these last years. But um, uh, from the fourth grade on up, the children are really interested in it. They just need to, to be exposed to it on a more frequent basis instead of just once a year. It gives future generations a connection to their past. Um, I, I would love to know more about my ancestors and what I do, but what little I do know, I appreciate it. And to retain our mountain heritage of hard work and doing for ourselves, that's just part of, of passing it on. And it's, there is maybe more of it being passed down, at least I hope so. One aspect of Appalachian culture that has been passed on and has become very much a part of mainstream America is the music. Just old time mountain music, uh, some people call it old time music now, and, and of course bluegrass. It's, it's different in country music, uh, especially now because it's, it's totally different because the bluegrass music uses acoustic instruments. Uh, the, the upright bass, they use the guitar, banjo, mandolin, fiddle. And, and they're all acoustic instruments. Where country music uses steel guitar, electric guitars, uh, drums, and, and that that sort of thing, and what makes it a very distinct sound, different sound. <laughs> My grandfather played the banjo, and uh, so just by watching him, and he taught me my first uh, few tunes on the banjo. My grandmother played, and my grandfather played, and but I think most of mine was spent uh, playing with guys my own age uh, in the area that we had a little group when we was in high school. My father worked in the coal mines, and uh, we used to get the Lester Flat and Earl Scrugg show, the Martha White show, on Saturday night, and we had. Uh, some of the older records by Jimmy Martin and Ralph Stanley. And he'd play them and him and mom would dance in the living room when we was just little. And I used to take my mother's broom handle and would try to make the chords as Lester Flat did. So my dad finally went to the Raven Drug Store and he bought me my first guitar when I was about eight years old. Millard Edwards and Tim Tolliver are part of a group called the Cross Ties. They travel up and down the Appalachian region playing old-time, bluegrass, and gospel music. They say that this music, that tells so many stories about living in and growing up in Appalachia, is becoming more and more popular across the country. It's been here for ever so long. 
uh, even before there was any instruments, when the old people just sung it a cappella. I don't want to reap what I've sown. What I've sown. Don't send me to the fire down below. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord have mercy on my soul. It's been around long before we ever come, and I'm sure that it'll be here long after we're gone. A love of music has always been a part of Appalachian life. In churches and schools and community gatherings and even informal get-togethers, Appalachians were always recalling tunes from the old days. John Heatwell recalls an interview with an Appalachian woman who told him about harvest days in the fall when neighbors would get together to help each other bring the crops in. People would bring banjos and fiddles and guitars and play music while the corn husking was going on. And uh, she would just sing snatches of some of the old songs. And she couldn't remember them all, but just little pieces of them. And one of them was uh, McDonald had an old gray mule and he drove him around in a cart. He loved that mule, and that mule loved him with all his mulish heart. Humor is another distinctive aspect of Appalachian culture, a way of retelling stories from the past or bringing out the character of a community. It's also a way to comment on inequalities and differences between uh, maybe Appalachia and the rest of the world, you know. So we like to tell stories that, that have us coming out kind of on top. Like the fellow who wanders into town and from up in the hills and he sees they're digging a big hole in the middle of town and he watches them a while and then the, the mayor of the town comes out to check on his workmen and he said, what are you going to put in that hole? And he th dismisses the fellow by saying, we're going to round up all the SOBs in town and put them in that hole. And the uh, country boy says, who's going to cover them up? <laughs> <laughs> For a lot of Americans, if you mention Appalachia or Hillbilly or Redneck or whatever, they already have an image there. And it's hard to crack. There was a book a few years ago by Pink Pinkney Benedict, who is a West Virginia short story writer. He wrote about people in the coal fields, and many of them were pretty hard, hard people and, uh, and had uh, difficult lives and so forth. And this reviewer uh, uh, reviewed it by saying these people are too broken to bond with anything more demanding than a beer can. This is a New York Times review, you know, by, by a southern woman who reviewed it. And, and she sort of extolled the north of industry and commerce in the south of, uh, of uh, history and romance and and that we are the cusp between the two that has neither. You know, I mean, denying us even culture, you know. And, and so uh, she could have learned something about the region if she wanted to comment on the region, but she made it seem as if all the people of Appalachia were like these people. Stereotypes, uh, they're convenient. They're little uh, things we stick on something to identify it uh, without having to think. A lot of people say I wouldn't go down there because somebody would do harm to you. I don't think uh, that would happen here as much as it would in, a, in lots of the cities of this country, you know. I think anybody who's decent and polite and uh, approaches mountain people in the right way will be treated respectfully, partly because there's still that old frontier ethic of, uh, of taking the stranger in, and, you know, and people will invite you to come in and eat and... Uh, and help you down the road. And I've had people say, well, follow me, I'll show you how to get there, and that sort of thing, you know. I don't, I don't, I've never had any problem whatever in the mountains. Uh, oh, a time or two I ran into uh, a couple of inebriated guys, you know, who uh, wanted to know what I was doing in a strange place, you know, and they, they said rather cheerfully, you look like somebody I'd like to beat the hell out of, you know. But I said, uh, I s immediately asked them if they knew where some, uh, some chairmaker lived. Oh, Shadrach, his name was, they said. And then they started telling me all about him, and we, they even invited me to go along and, uh, on the drunk with him, you know. People shouldn't judge an area or a people just by what they hear. It's taken a very enduring, hardworking, people to stay here and to, to make a living in these mountains. This is who we are, or part of who we are. And to get away from the stereotypes and to see what 
is actually here and what has been here for hundreds of years in the talent of our people and the craftsmanship that they develop, I think that's really important to get that out there so people can see you know, what we're really all about here. It's, it's not what they've been led to believe. In any city, in any country, in any area of the world, you can find sullen faces of the impoverished. You can come across hostility and an aversion to outsiders. These are not unique to Appalachia, nor are they indicative of an entire population. As a television crew with a camera, we were outsiders to these people, and yet they welcomed us with the familiarity of old friends, eager to share their kindness, their humor, their heritage with us. There is a spirit among them, an affinity for each other and a respect for the past, a past founded in determination and self-sufficiency and responsibility for family and community, a past that finds expression in these quilts and dolls and works of art and in this music, all telling the story of a culture born and nurtured in the mountain's shadow. For a VHS copy of the program you've just seen, please send 1995 to WVPT or contact us for information on how to pay by credit card. <laughs>